Located in western Turkey on the Aegean shores, Izmir is fondly known as the Pearl of the Aegean, the third largest city in Turkey and home to well over three million people. Izmir is a busy and prosperous port city with deep roots in antiquity. Previously known as Smyrna, Izmir has a long and illustrious history. With its fertile land, favorable climate, 300 sunny days a year, a sea that offers every shade of blue, and the heritage left behind by the 32 civilizations it has been a home to. Ismar is a remarkable city. Its current incarnation is rather more modern, particularly in the swanky, bar-filled Alsenkak area just north of the center. The Konak shopping area to the south and the coastal road that binds them together. Come with me on a journey, the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Christ in Turkey. The fact that almost half of its population is under the age of 30 makes Izmir today a city full of life. The city hosts tens of thousands of university students, educating scientists, artists, business leaders, and academics. With its natural treasures, historical values, various accommodation options that appeal to every budget, sound infrastructure of sea, air, land, and railway transportation and healthy, delicious, and colorful cuisine, warm and friendly people. Izmir is a city whose visitors return home satisfied and wanting to go back again. In the Gulf of Izmir, you may prefer the sea route, a ferry, to transport you to the opposite side of the city. Take the opportunity to feed the birds as you are on your way. The city of Smyr is home to rich museums exhibiting many findings from the Roman period to the Republican period. The Agora Open Air Museum is situated in the center of the city. It is the best location from which to view what is left of the ancient city of Smyrna. In the Roman era, the Agora, a multi-story structure, was built on arches and pillars around a large square with marble tiling. The word Agora means marketplace. The Roman bathhouse, which was recently unearthed, is the latest Agora expedition, attracts the attention of visitors passing by Falsina Road, which runs through the northwestern gate to the docks. The pieces extracted from the Agora are in the Smear Archaeological Museum and the History of Arts Museum today. The Smear Archaeological Museum spans 5,000 square meters. In the middle of the floor, we find the hall of works of stone. In this hall, there are large statues, busts, portraits, and masks. One of the most fascinating artifacts in the museum is the marble Androclus statue, which has been dated to Roman times. It is believed to have belonged to Androclus, the founder of Ephesus. Izmir is the site of ancient Smyrna. According to legend, Smyrna was founded by an Amazon and named after her. According to Aristotle, Smyrna was actually founded three times, once by Tantalus or Pelops, again by Theseus, and finally by Alexander the Great. Smyrna was originally settled by Aeolian Greeks around 1000 BC. A number of great literary figures came from Smyrna. According to history, Homer, the author of the epics Iliad and Odyssey, was associated with Smyrna. Smyrna was destroyed by Aliates, king of Lydia, early in the 6th century BC and existed as a village for about 400 years. The city was reportedly refounded by Alexander the Great, but more likely by Antigonus and Lysimachus around 290 BC at its present site on the slopes of Mount Pegasus, now called Kadifekal. In 193 BC, Smyrna became the first city in Asia Minor to erect a temple in honor of Dea Roma. 
In 23 AD, Tiberius permitted the construction of a temple in honor of the Emperor Augustus, his mother Livia, and the Senate. In 26 AD, Emperor Tiberius chose Smyrna, one of 11 applicants to be a temple warden for the cult of Tiberius, Livy, and the Senate. In the first century, the population was probably about 200,000 residents. It had the status of a free city. It was a political, religious, and cultural center noted for the science and medicine that flourished right here. It was proud of its famous stadium, library, and the largest public theater in the province, seating some 20,000 people. It was a wealthy and exceptionally beautiful city, claiming to be the glory of Asia. The city suffered a devastating earthquake in 178 AD and another in 180, but it was rebuilt under the patronage of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Though Smyrna is mentioned only twice in the New Testament, it became an important Christian center in the second century AD. Ignatius of Antioch, on a forced march to Rome where he would be martyred, stopped at Smyrna and there wrote letters to four other churches in the region. When he arrived at Troas, he wrote a letter to the Church of Smyrna and also a personal letter to Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna. The Exophal, an apocryphal book from New Testament times, apparently contained an account of a visit to Smyrna by Paul before coming to Ephesus. A visit to Smyrna by the Apostle John and his disciples is mentioned in the Acts of John, another apocryphal book, as a response to an invitation by the people of Smyrna. There was also a Jewish presence in Smyrna, as Revelation 2.9 suggests, and as a number of inscriptions confirm, famous inscription from 123 to 24 AD during the reign of Hadrian refers to a contribution of 10,000 drachmas for some unknown public works project by former Jews or people formerly from Judea. The life of the Christian community in Smyrna was one of affliction and poverty. Two things contributed to the miserable and life-threatening situation of the church. First, the city was the center of emperor worship. At the time of the book of Revelation was written, emperor worship became mandatory. Once a year, every Roman citizen was obliged to perform the religious duty of burning incense on the altar to the godhead of Caesar, and then was issued a certificate. To refuse brought about the threat of death. Smyrnians were openly very hostile towards the Christians in the city because of their refusal to participate in emperor worship. The second thing that made life miserable for Christians in Smyrna was the presence of a large and strong Jewish population, also very hostile toward Christians. In their bitterness, the Jews joined the pagans in hating and persecuting Christians. They slandered the Christians before their local government, making malicious accusations, thus stirring up the pagans against the Christians and inciting the authorities to persecute them. Christians were charged with being cannibals, atheists, and disloyal to the government. John depicts these Jews as the synagogue of Satan. Although in extreme danger, the Christians in Smyrna were found faithful. Many of them experienced heroic suffering and death. Among those who suffered martyrdom was Polycarp, the famous bishop of the church of Smyrna in the first half of the second century, who in his youth associated with John, the author of the book of Revelation. One of the oldest standing churches in Izmir, the St. Polycarp Church, still acts as one of the chief centers of the local Catholic diocese. This church celebrates Polycarp, who was martyred by the Romans at age 86 in 155 AD at Kadifkali, which was atop the hill near modern-day Izmir. According to tradition, he was taken from his hiding place, making no effort to resist. He offered his captors food and drink, then asked for time to pray, which he did for two hours. Again, they asked him to sacrifice to the emperor. Swear by the genius of Caesar and we will release you, they said. 
He replied, 86 years I have served him and he never did me wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? It is recorded that when they tried to burn Polycarp at the stake, the flames wouldn't touch him. They finally stabbed him to death. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. Smyrna was the next closest city to Ephesus, about 50 kilometers to the north. 700 years before, Ozminer had been destroyed and had lain in ruins for three centuries. The city of John's time was one which had risen from the dead. The message to the church in this city is the shortest of the seven and is one of only two that had received no rebuke from Christ and no call to repentance. In John's time, the Christians in Smyrna, like John himself, were experiencing tribulation, which was going to continue and possibly intensify. The main message to Smyrna is that Christ is always with his children, even in suffering, and that Christ's followers must not be fearful, but faithful, to look not at the suffering, but beyond it, to Jesus. In the salutation of each of the seven letters, Christ identifies himself by means of some part of the description in the initial vision of Revelation 1, 13 through 16. Jesus introduces himself as him who is the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. What is the significance of Jesus' description of himself in this way? It is significant in the light of the suffering that some of the believers in Smyrna would have to endure. These are the words which John heard earlier when he fell down at Jesus' feet. Stop being afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I am living forever and ever. The first and the last is a reference to the Old Testament to Yahweh, the God of the covenant. Jesus begins his message to these minions by reminding them of his own suffering and death. He experienced the worst that life could bring. He died, but he was raised in life again. In identifying himself with the Smyrnians, Jesus is telling them that no matter what might happen, he, the resurrected and glorified Lord, can help because he has gone through it and he was victorious over death. So they too can face martyrdom, knowing that faithfulness is rewarded with eternal life. He remains faithful to his promise to always be present with his suffering people. As usual, Christ affirms his awareness of their circumstances. I know your works, tribulation and poverty. Why were the believers at Smyrna in tribulation and poverty? The members of the church were in dire peril. In Greek, tribulation means a serious affliction under the pressure of a burden that crushes. This pressure comes from outside, namely from the demands for emperor worship and the malignant slander of the Jews. Second, the members were in extreme poverty. As the Greek text indicates, they possessed nothing. Their poverty was undoubtedly the result of the persecution uh, the church was going through. It certainly contrasts with the wealthy church of Laodicea, which boasted of its material riches and was in need of nothing, but it possessed nothing of spiritual significance. The Christians in Smyrna lived in one of the wealthiest cities and yet they were extremely poor. The reality, my friend, is that Christ knows your situation, your burdens, 
and your tears as well. Nothing passes unnoticed in his eyes. The psalmist wrote, You know how troubled I am. You have kept a record of my tears. He not only knows, but he cares about you and your situation. For this reason, Peter wrote in his first letter, Throw all your worry on him, because he cares for you. Jesus praises the church at Smyrna, saying, You are rich. In what way were the believers at Smyrna rich? They were poor in worldly goods, but rich in spiritual blessings. They were poor in spirit, but rich in grace. Their spiritual riches were offset by their outward poverty. Many who are rich in worldly goods are spiritual paupers. This was the case with the church of Laodicea. But in Smyrna, some who were outwardly poor were inwardly rich. They were rich in good deeds, rich in spiritual privileges, and rich in hope. James wrote to a similar group indicating that God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith. The reality is that you don't truly know how rich you are until you really know that Jesus is all you need. And you don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. The letter written to the church at Smyrna has in common with the Philadelphian church this rare claim. Christ only has commendation and no condemnation for Smyrna. The lesson that I learned from this is that during the time of suffering, it is not time for rebukes or condemnation. It is time for support and care. That is the picture that I find about God in the Bible, a loving and caring Father that during times of tribulation is there to attend to His children. But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted and you consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Jesus has two main counsels to the Church of Smyrna. The first one is, stop fearing the things which you are about to suffer. The Smyrnians evidently worry. Jesus is telling them, stop being afraid, I'm in control. I have personally experienced death and came back to life. I am the first and the last, and I'm faithful to my promise. Fearlessness, however, may not necessarily mean the total absence of dread, but rather the refusal to succumb to intimidation, so that threats of harm do not turn them back from their duty to Christ. Jesus' second counsel is, Remain faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. This church has already been faithful, and Jesus urges continued faithfulness. The reward for faithfulness is the crown of life, namely, the crown that consists of life. It is not a royal crown, but the crown of victory, the garland given to the winner at the Olympic Games, signifying the joy that comes from victory. One of the main reasons for these two councils was that the church in Smyrna was soon to become a special object of diabolical malice, as the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. You will have tribulation. The book of Revelation is realistic about the existence of evil in the world. There is harm which must be squarely faced for what it is. No attempt is made to explain away the reality of evil in its many forms. It is neither true nor helpful for the Christian to interpret all crisis events in the story of human existence as according to God's will. There are many events that happen in our lives that are against God's will. The speeding car that crashes because its driver was under the influence of alcohol or drugs is not an event that happened according to God's will. Murder, suicide, adultery, racism, white-collar crime, these are all acts against the will of God. They are the result of the wrong use of freedom, which then sours into chaos and menace. The mystery is that the real freedom which God designed for human journey has made human evil possible. Thankfully, that same freedom has made faith and hope and love possible too. 
But evil has a larger dimension than simply the bad choices that we make as human beings. There is a cosmic dimension which this letter to the Church of Smyrna brings into sharp focus. The wrong choice against the will of God at the cosmic level of creation produces its own kind of chaos. The clear affirmation of this letter is that cosmic evil as well as human evil is bounded by the greater boundary of Almighty God. The evil and its damage are real danger, but that damage is not ultimate. The last word, both of judgment and of hope, belongs to God. How does this work in practical terms? It means that as God's child, I am able to face up to tragedy as tragedy and not artificially assume the stance that it has somehow not really happened. It means that there are bad experiences and events that happen to us and because of us. These events are negative and harmful. They're like jagged rocks that scar the landscape of our life's journey. But the discovery we make in the gospel of Jesus Christ is that the very landscape upon which these angry outcroppings stand is surrounded by a larger grace and will so that life can go on. The field will grow seed and bear healthy crops because the power of God's gift of life is greater than the adverse effects of either human sin or cosmic evil. This is the reason we do not lose hope. This is also the reason we are enabled to call a jagged rock a jagged rock. This second letter ends with a very personal assurance to the Christians who live in the shadow of Smyrna's Acropolis. I will give you the crown, not of Smyrna, but of life. What an exciting and deeply personal promise to these people. Those who remain faithful will receive the crown consisting of life. That is to say, they will not experience the second death. In Revelation, the second death means the total extinction of the wicked. It stands in opposition to eternal life. The Smyrnaeans were in constant fear of physical death. To the faithful, however, physical death is temporary. It is like a sleep and as such means nothing because of the hope of the resurrection. It is the second death that should be feared, eternal death from which there will be no resurrection. Jesus warned his followers, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. By virtue of his death on the cross and resurrection, Jesus broke the power of death. He is the one having the keys of death and Hades. He lives forevermore on behalf of his people. The faithful will receive the crown of eternal life and therefore will not be harmed by the second death. Friend, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know that God is with you. For this reason, he says to you, don't be afraid because I'm with you. Don't be anxious because I am your God. I keep on strengthening you. I'm truly helping you. I'm surely upholding you with my victorious right hand. Suffering does not have to be the end of your story. If you surrender to God, you can be sure that tears may flow in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Until that day, when suffering will be banished forever, God's promise to you is this, I will take care of you. Rest in God's love because he takes care of you. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath His wings of love abide, God will take care of you.
Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we give you thanks for the assurance today that you know all about us and you still love us. And Lord, as we uh, seek to embrace this journey, looking at the seven churches and the messages that you have for these churches, we pray that you would help us to take these messages to heart. We pray that our, our lives would be changed on this journey. Lord, we are grateful for the assurance that you are with us through all the seasons of our lives. Continue to shape us. Continue to work in us what is pleasing to you. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, and shape us for that moment when we will spend eternity with you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friend, thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to share the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Christ and Turkey with your friends and relatives. Please visit our website where you can leave us a message, your prayer request and order a cup of today show or the complete series. If you feel moved to support our ministry, you can make your donation on our website as well. I hope to see you soon.